Section 11.6 .6 deals with aromatic hydrocarbons and benzenes. Structure was first proposed about 150 years ago by K. Coulet. So K. Coulet first proposed it, and I told you a little bit about that. And that he had the structure, um, or he knew the molecular formula was C6H6, and he proposed that it had double bonds, but it didn't react like it had any unsaturate, unsaturation. So that means it didn't react like an alkene does. So if I take a look at the structure of benzene, what he found is that the structure of benzene, when it was reacted with bromine, it didn't undergo any reaction. So it didn't undergo an addition reaction the same way an alkene did. Just a little bit more information with the name aromatic is that the first aromatic compounds that were isolated did come from, you know, pleasant smelling resins from trees. Anyhow, but since then we've discovered that many aromatic compounds are odorless or many of them have, you know, foul odors. Anyhow, here's an example. This is called pyridine. I expect you to know this one, pyridine. It's the only heterocycle you have to know for the first exam. And it has a very foul odor. So there's an example of an uh, aromatic um, compound that doesn't smell good. Anyhow, so now aromatic hydrocarbons are characterized by a much higher degree of chemical stability than predicted by their chemical composition. So you can link the two words aromatic and stability. So aromatic is just nothing more than a compound that has um, a high degree of chemical stability. So the most common group of aromatic compounds is based on the six-membered ring, the benzene structure. So again, you should be able to draw a benzene ring. So we have six carbons and six hydrogens, and we have alternating double and single bonds. And of course, they're joined in a planar hexagonal arrangement so every single one of the carbons here, these are all trigonal planar. So these are all trigonal planar, if you remember your Vesper theory from Chemistry 101. So that means that um, benzene is a planar structure, so it's rather flat. So if I take a look at the two structures that are drawn here at the bottom, um, it says here two equivalent structures were proposed by K. Coulet. And now we call these um, resonant structures. So what he proposed is that the double bonds and the single bonds were switching back and forth very quickly, and so quickly that it couldn't react like an alkene does. But we know that that is not true. We know that the actual um, electrons that are involved in the double bonds, that those are actually constantly moving around the ring, and that's what's being represented by these pink arrows. We're showing that these electrons are constantly moving around, and that contributes um, to the true structure, and that also has something to do with the, with the stability of benzene. The modern concept of benzene structure is based on overlapping orbitals, and I have more on that on another slide, but each carbon is bonded to two others by sharing a pair of electrons, and uh, these same carbon atoms also share a pair of electrons with a hydrogen atom. Anyhow, if I take a look at these four structures here, in A I have the full Lewis structure, and then I told you that in D you can draw a circle inside to represent the fact that... Um, all of the electrons in the pi bonds are constantly moving around. But this is what we're going to use in chemistry 102 whenever we're drawing bond line structures. So I would say the A and B would be the best ones to use for our class. Anyhow, more information about, those, um, about the uh, remaining six electrons. So those six electrons that are in the pi bond. So if I again draw the structure of benzene, you know that those double bonds, so I have one, two, three double bonds in all three of these, these are pi bonds, and in every pi bond, um, there are two electrons. So if I have two electrons in every pi bond times, oops, times three, that means I have a total of six electrons that are in pi bonds. So these are the six electrons in pi bonds. And the thing is, is that these p orbitals, they all overlap like this. So they're constant, or they're continuously overlapping like this, and forming basically a conduit. And this is just trying to give you a more ac accurate representation of what it looks like when those p orbitals overlap. And what happens is that they form a cloud of electrons both above and below the ring. So they all overlap. And again, electrons like to move. If they can move, they will. And what it does is that when you give the electrons more room to move around, it increases the stability of the compound. And that helps explain a little bit more about the stability of uh of, of benzene anyhow talking about nomenclature and how we name benzene derivatives it says here that most simple aromatic compounds are just simply named as derivatives of benzene so if i take a look at mono substituted benzenes i just name the group and throw benzene at the end so here i have a nitro group on top so this rno2 
So that's a nitro group. So here I have nitrobenzene. And then, of course, hopefully you recognize ethyl. So that's an ethyl benzene and then a bromobenzene. If I was to replace, you know, if I was to replace one of the hydrogens with a with a chlorine, of course, I'd have chlorobenzene and I could have, what else? I could have fluorobenzene. Let's see. If I was to put an isopropyl group on there, so if I put an isopropyl group, then I'd have isopropyl benzene and so on and so forth. So some historical nomenclature says here that some members of the benzene family have unique names that were required long before the IUPAC system was was developed, and we and we still still use them today. So these four molecules here, you're responsible for memorizing all four of these. So if I have a a benzene ring with a methyl group on it. We don't call that methyl benzene. It's got a common name, which is toluene. If I have a hydroxyl, I get phenol. If I have an NH2 group, so an amine, we call this aniline. And then the last one is when I have a carboxyl group or a carboxylic acid. That's benzoic acid. So these are going to be important in nomenclature. And we're going to look at an example that involves aniline in a few minutes. So for di-substituted benzenes, and I'll point out that it's very important that we're dealing with di which means two. So for di-substituted benzenes, um, we name the groups in alphabetical order. The first, uh, sorry, the, na the first named group is at position one, and if a special group is present, it must be number one on the ring. What I mean by a special group, that means if, um, if you're dealing with an aniline, you know, if you're dealing with an aniline or a phenol, a phenol or a carboxylic acid, Etc. And again, we'll look at an example of that. So an older system of naming indicates groups using ortho, meta, and para. So ortho for 1, 2, meta for 1, 3, and para for 1, 4 substitution on a benzene ring. And again, before we move on to the next slide, I just want to point out that di-substituted benzenes are the only time that we can use this system. So if I have a tri or a tetra-substitute or a penta-substituted benzene, I cannot use ortho, meta, and para. Those go out the window. So let's take a look here. So here are three compounds. They're all isomers of each other. So I have um, diethylbenzene um, uh, isomers. So the first one is 1,2 substituted. So I have 1,2. This one I have 1,3. And then the last one I have 1 and 4 substitution. So again, just to, to, co to go over this again. So if they're 1,2 substituted, that's ortho. 1,3 is meta, and 1,4 is para. And I use the ortho, meta, and para as a prefix before I name the rest of the compound. Another shorthand, instead of writing a ortho, meta, or para, you can just use O, M, and P. And of course, if you want to stick to the IUPAC nomenclature and use numbers, or what we call locants, that works, uh, that works perfectly well. So... What are the rules here? It says when I have a poly-substituted benzene, so this means beyond two substituents, it says I'm going to number to give the lowest possible numbers around the ring, and then I'll alphabetize, so just follow the alphabet. But then it says here once the substituents are part of the common roots, so the common roots that you need to be aware of are aniline, aniline, right, phenol, benzoic acid, and what was the last one? Toluene. So you need to be aware of these four common roots. So you would name the molecule as a derivative of that common root, that monosubstituted benzene. And then the carbon that has the nitrogen and aniline, the carbon that has the hydroxyl and phenol, so on, that is assumed to be carbon number one, but you leave one out of the name. So let's take a look at this example here. So I have an ethyl group on my benzene ring. I have a propyl group on my benzene ring, and I have a chloro group on my benzene ring. And of course, if I look at the numbering, I have one ethyl, oops, I have one ethyl, two propyl, and then I have four chloro like that. Now, of course, you might be tempted to, you know, try to number it this way, one, two, three, four, and five, but you can see that that doesn't work because one, two, and four are a lower set of numbers than one, two, and five. So those aren't going to work. So we assign the lowest set of numbers, and then we just alphabetize. So we have chloro, and then we have ethyl, and then we have propyl. So we get four chloro, one ethyl, two propyl benzene, like that. If I take a look at this one, it says here, name the molecule as a derivative of the common root. So the common root is highlighted in brown, and that is aniline. So what I meant by um, the rule, the last rule a couple slides ago, is that this is assumed to be carbon one immediately. The one that has the NH2 from the aniline, that's going to be carbon number one. And then I just want to give the substituents the lowest possible numbers. 
So in this case, I go counterclockwise, I give my chloros a two and a five, and of course, since there's two of them, I have to say dichloro, so this is 2,5-dichloroaniline. When benzene is a substituent, it's not called benzene anymore, then it's called a phenyl. So notice the, the formula of a phenyl, so it's C6H5. So if I have just a benzene like this, of course, this is C6H6. But if I remove one of those hydrogens and I have it as a substituent, which I'm going to represent by this bond, and then I'll put a squiggle here. So if the, if the benzene ring is just dangling off as a substituent, then the formula becomes C6H5 because I lost that hydrogen, right? So then we call it a phenyl. So then it's a substituent just like a methyl or an ethyl or a propyl or a butyl, so on and so forth. It is a phenyl group. So if I wanted to name this compound here, the only really um, good way that we would know how to name this is to look at the longest chain that involves the alkene, and I have one, two, three, four, so that makes this a one butene. And then in this case, I'm gonna treat the aromatic ring, I'm gonna treat this benzene as a substituent in this case, so this would be 3-phenyl-1-butene. And of course, phenol, phenol is a functional group or is the name of this compound here, so phenol. All right, let's move on. So polynuclear um, aromatic hydrocarbons, these are sometimes called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are composed of two or more rings that are joined together. Many of these have been shown to cause cancer, which is, um, carcinogenic. So many of these are carcinogenic, so you should know the word carcinogenic. Naphthalene, if you've ever purchased mothballs before, so that's what mothballs are. They're made from, oops, they're made from naphthalene and it has a very distinct odor. And of course they sublime, so it goes from solid to a gas at room temperature. Benzopyrene is a, is a side product of the combustion of tobacco and wood smoke and these kinds of things. And it is also, it's been found to be very carcinogenic. So let's take a look at the reactions of benzene. So again, benzene does not readily undergo addition reactions. So it doesn't undergo addition reactions like alkenes. Rather, it undergoes substitution reactions. So there's a big difference between addition and substitution. So addition, no. Substitution, yes. So an atom or group substitutes for a hydrogen on the ring. And that's what a substitution reaction is. So it says, all benzene reactions we consider require a catalyst. So everything that we look at um, with benzene, anytime benzene is going to react, it's going to require a catalyst. And these are the three reactions we're going to look at. Halogenation, nitration, and sulfonation. So halogenation places either a bromine or a chlorine, so no fluorine or iodine, on the ring. And the reagent that we use is bromine or chlorine. And up to here, it looks similar to the addition reaction on an alkene, but keep in mind, this is not an addition reaction, this is a substitution reaction. And the difference is that when we use benzene, we need to have iron or iron three bromide as a catalyst. So again, we have to have a catalyst, whereas with an alkene, we did not need one. So if I take a look at what's going on here, if I draw out the Lewis structure of bromine just for fun, so there's my bromine, which is a diatomic molecule. If you think about what's going on, I'm gonna draw one of the hydrogens in for, uh, for demonstration purposes only. So I'm gonna replace one of this hydrogen with one of these bromines. So then what would I be left over with? I'd be left over with a hydrogen atom and I'd be left over with a bromine which manifests itself in HBr. So that's the substitution reaction. Also keep in mind that over my reaction arrow, I have to have my catalyst. And iron three bromide works, or if you wanted to just simply write iron, that works as well. The next reaction is nitration. So nitration places a nitro group. So you should know what a nitro group, that's NO2 on the ring. And then the catalyst in this case is sulfuric acid. So you actually make a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid. So you wanna be sure you have a lab coat and goggles and gloves on when you're doing this reaction. So you take the benzene, mix it with nitric acid and concentrated sulfuric acid, which is the, oops, which is the, oops, which is the catalyst in this case. Anyhow, and you heat that up a little bit and you add a nitro group. So you go from just benzene and you replace this hydrogen with the nitro group like that. So nitration. And the last one places an SO3H group. So there's a name for this group. It's called a sulfonic acid. So a sulfonic acid. So it places a sulfonic acid or an SO3H group on the ring 
and the catalyst that's required is sulfuric acid, and the reagent that's required is sulfur trioxide, which is a gas at room temperature. So again, I'm going to replace one of the hydrogens with my SO3H group, and I make a sulfonic acid. So if you wanted to represent this, you know, benzene sulfonic acid, if you wanted to just draw it and write SO3H, that would be perfectly acceptable. Maybe I should try to fix, fix that pi bond. Anyhow, there we go. So that's the last reaction. Again, sulfur trioxide and then sulfuric acid as your catalyst. So a summary of the reactions. So halogenation, sulfonation, and nitration. You need to know all of these reactions. Just one last thing I'll say about these is if the halogen, the example that we looked at was using bromine, but if you used chlorine, instead of using FeBr3, you would use FeCl3. So that's iron three chloride. All right, so let's take a look at heterocyclic aromatic compounds. It says that rings with at least one atom other than carbon is part of the structure of the aromatic ring. These are heterocyclic aromatic compounds. So the hetero atom is usually oxygen, nitrogen, or sulfur. There are other atoms, but these are the ones that are most typically um, seen in aromatic compounds, in heterocyclic aromatic compounds. So the ring also has delocalized electrons, which impart stability. So again, stability. Uh, stabil st stability. <laughs> Anyhow, so you find a lot of aromatic, um, heterocyclic aromatic compounds and uh, pieces in, in marketed drugs because they're so stable. So the only one that I ask you to know is pyridine. You should be able to draw pyridine. I like to draw it showing explicitly all of the pi bonds like this and put my lone pair on the nitrogen. Um, you might re recognize, if you've studied biology, you might recognize pyrimidine and purine from RNA and DNA, and then I have some other ones here. So here's an example of some, or some examples of some marketed compounds and how much money they made in the billions of dollars. So I have Nexium and Gleevec and Aliquis. And you can see that there's a heterocyclic aromatic compound here. This is called pyrazole. And then what else? I have, uh, you can see that I have an heterocycle there. I have the pyridine here in Gleevec. And then in Nexium, I have a pyridine here, and then I also have this really big one. So that's called a benzimidazole. Anyhow, if you were to, you know, just do a, a random internet search of just about any marketed um, drug, most of them will have some kind of heterocyclic aromatic portion inside of the molecule. So um, they're similar to benzene in that they're very stable, okay, and they have similar reactivity. Um, again, many of them are biologically significant, so you should be aware of them. Um, uh, purines and pyrimidines, again, are found in RNA and DNA, and pyridine is actually found in nicotine. So pyridine uh, has many uses, but if you look up the structure of nicotine, you'll see that it's just a pyridine ring with another um, small ring with a nitrogen in it attached directly to it. And then pyrrole, so pyrrole is a component of hemoglobin and chlorophyll, and here's the porphyrin part of a hemoglobin molecule. And we'll talk more about hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin later on in Chemistry 102. So a summary of what you need to know. So the alkenes, that was the first portion of the chapter, and then we did a little bit about polymers. But what you need to know about benzene, you need to know the halogenation, nitration, and sulfonation reactions. Um, this, these are the addition reactions of the alkenes, so that's not what this video is about, but you should be aware of these, of course. And then the pol polymer reaction, uh, that was covered earlier in chapter 11. This is what this video is about. It was about the reactions of benzene, so again, the halogenation nitration and sulfonation, you should know all of these. And then here's some questions that you might want to try from our textbook. And I hope you find this video helpful for sections 11.6 and 11.7.